speak to Ian Lustig. He holds the Best W. Heyman Chair in the Political Science Department at the University of Pennsylvania. Ian, thank you so much indeed for your time. Um, just pick up for us, if you don't mind, on what Mohammed there was talking about, what's happening in those cities inside Israel where there are mixed communities and there's intra-community violence. You've actually written a book about Israel's Arab-Palestinian population. Yes, I, I, I have. I, I think he makes a, a wonderful point that uh, what you have now is a kind of what, what I call a one-state reality, uh, so that when something happens in Jerusalem, it doesn't stay in Jerusalem. It has uh, massive repercussions in Gaza, in Tiberias, in Ramla, inside of Israel, and in the West Bank, uh, because the uh, basic problem is that in this one state, uh, which is ruled in different ways over different groups uh, by the same government, only Jews, for the most part, have an effective voice in politics. So you have about half the population that lives in this area excluded from effective participation in politics. When that is bound to lead to explosions and wars, but increasingly the wars that we're seeing, the fighting is kind of more resembles a civil war than it does an interstate war. Uh, and that's what's so different about this encounter. Uh, and one aspect that has not been commented upon very much is that because of the reduction in the police presence in Arab communities inside of Israel, the amount of crime there has exploded, which means that tens of thousands if, uh, of, of weapons are available to uh, Arab citizens of Israel. And so far, those weapons have not really been used uh, in these clashes, but I'm sure that's an aspect of great concern to the Israeli government. Um, in terms of any sort of longer-term solution, because at the end of the day, the problems are decades old. We know that the Oslo Accords are practically defunct. I mean, the peace process is practically dead. If there were to be any sort of even hint towards some kind of resolution, which side would have to make the greater compromise here? Well, unfortunately, you're more than right. It, not only is the Oslo process uh, ended, and not only is the two-state solution idea dead, but even the metaphor of, of its approaching death is dead. Uh, for a decade and now or more, people have been saying that it's virtually dead. The fact that we don't accept that there's no longer a way out through negotiations between Palestinians and Israelis to separate them from one another means that, that there has been no real attention to the avenues that are available, which is to transform the whole country into a democratic, a more democratic country. Some long-term process of democratization has to occur. And there are some bright lights, uh, the fact that a government was about to be formed in Israel because the Jewish parties were finally ready to accept an Arab party as part of the coalition is a massive step forward. Now, that's been delayed because of the fighting, but ultimately, in uh, giving Palestinian Arabs, whether they live in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem, or inside of the Green Line, meaningful opportunities to uh, improve their lives without violence, that's the key in the long run, although I think it's a process of decades and generations of change. It's really interesting, Ian, that you mentioned the current political situation, of course, in Israel, because many people might say that Benjamin Netanyahu has been moving further to the right the longer he's been prime minister. You used in one of your uh, books the phrase holocaustia. I mean, does the move to the right make any sort of resolution more improbable? Uh, Yes, it does. But again, I want to examine the concept of resolution. A lot of people have the image that the way these problems are solved is that the representatives of the two groups get together and reach a compromise through negotiations. That was the plan and the idea of the two-state solution, that through those negotiations, Israel would withdraw from the West Bank and Gaza and a Palestinian state would be established. But when you have this kind of an enmeshed uh, situation where one Ele one out of every 11 Israeli Jews lives in the West Bank, uh, beyond the Green Line. You're not talking, you're talking about a situation of a partial democracy, one for Jews, that excludes half the population. And that 
process of inclusion of that excluded population takes a very, very long time. Uh, think about the way women in Western, in most countries, got political rights, not because they negotiated with men, but because men kept fighting among themselves and some wanted to get women's support to win over the other men. That's how blacks in the United States got real political power. Also, it took generations of struggle like that. And I anticipate that uh, people after this encounter will be realizing more and more that without, since they can't move in the two-state uh, direction, they must reach across the lines and find allies in the other camp to change the character of Israeli democracy. Ian Lustig, can't thank you enough for spending time with us on the News Hour. Really, really interesting to hear your analysis. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thanks for having me.